So that, that is really cool for me. Um, and indeed, um, Though the Heavens May Fall uh, was a book uh, that, of history that I wrote that, that talked about um, a very famous slave trial. I make sure I don't... Slave trial in London in 1772. And it took me three years to write. And some people ask me why I wrote it, why it took me three years to write, uh, and or why I would take three years off to do it. And it was because uh, that was in 2002 to 2005. And that was because at that time, I, wa I wanted to model the, lit the coming litigation of the Non-Human Rights Project on the litigation uh, for James Somerset. So James Somerset uh, was indeed a slave. And uh, he had been kidnapped in Africa and taken to, uh, to, to the New World in Virginia. He went to Massachusetts, all up and down the eastern seaboard. Then he went to London, where he escaped. And, his, and uh, Charles Stewart, who was his master, uh, hired slave catchers to find him. And when they did, uh, they then uh, chained him to the deck of a ship uh, to, to sail him to Jamaica, where he would be uh, sold in the slave markets and be forced to harvest sugarcane for the next three to five years until he just died. And his, his godparents came in and sought a common law writ of habeas corpus on behalf of James Somerset. And the ensuing trial um, raises all of the issues that are raised by the Non-Human Rights Project in its work. And we, it also prepares us, for un, pre, prepares us for understanding what the judges sometimes tell us what other opponents sometimes tell us. So we're prepared for those arguments because those arguments were the ones that were raised against uh, the entire idea of, of having a black person no longer be a thing but be a person. Uh, so for me, uh, Though the Heavens May Fall um, is, is, has been a really important book. Um, also when I finished it, I was distraught that I could no longer live in 18th century London in my mind every day. Um, I, I got to like it a lot. So, uh, one other thing, um, I, met, uh, I teach, as you may know, at Lewis and Clark Law School every summer. And I've been doing it for the last eight or nine or ten years. But what happens to me is that I end up in the emergency room at OHSU every single, uh, every single time I'm here for one reason or another. And I thought, I'm only here for 24 hours today. Uh, uh, what could go wrong? <laughs> So anyway, I woke up uh, this morning, because from here I go to Hong Kong and then India and Malaysia. And so I have a suitcase that's a lot bigger than you might usually bring to Oregon. And so I woke up in the morning and my back is killing me and I can't you know, move. So I may be sitting down and standing up, uh, but I decided I would not go to OHSU, where I, I've cultivated a lot of friendships um, <laughs> over the years. And uh, two years ago, when I actually was brought in for emergency surgery, the surgeon handed me her card and said she really wanted to attend my class. Uh, so, you know, you make contacts wherever you can. So let me tell you about what the Non-Human Rights Project does, and then specifically refer to our l litigation that we're doing with respect to elephants in Connecticut, and then likely uh, there may be elephants in California uh, as well. Uh, and then every now and then I, I may refer back to the James Somerset case because, as I said, uh, the, issues, the issues are so similar. And by the way, those of you who have seen our HBO film, um, Unlocking the Cage, um, might also know that the, uh, the fact that the arguments concerning the legal personhood and the rights of a non-human animal and the rights of a slave sometimes piss the judges off. Uh, because they misunderstand what we're doing and they think we're comparing black people to non-human animals. And uh, as, as you can see in the film, there, there's one judge who clearly wishes to jump over the bench and slap me. And when I tell her, as you can see in the film, I say, well, let me put it this way. Let me try to explain to you. And she, she tells me uh, basically to shut up. She doesn't want to hear me explain it. She just wants me to talk about something else. Uh, so it, it is indeed a, uh, a uh, double-edged sword that, uh, that that's one of the numerous things that the people, in the non, that lawyers in the Non-Human Rights Project had to try to figure out how to deal with. Uh, so since Roman times, the legal world has divided all of the entities in it between things and persons. And so I imagine this wall, this legal wall that has for over 2,000 for two years has separated you know, things from persons. And the thing about a thing is that 
as far as the law is concerned, that thing is invisible to it. It doesn't have any, um, any value, any inherent value, any intrinsic value. The only value that a thing has is its value to a person. It's essentially invisible to the civil law. It's not good to be a thing. On the other side are the persons of the world. A person is highly visible to the law. The value that the law gives it is inherent. It's, it's, it's worth something in and of itself, not just uh, uh, its value to persons. Uh, it has the capacity for one or a hundred or an infinite number of legal rights. On the other hand, a thing lacks the capacity for any legal rights. And that is really the legal distinction between the two. A thing lacks the capacity for any legal rights. A person has the capacity, the capacity for an infinite number of legal rights. One of the problems, one of the many problems that the Non-Human Rights Project faces when we go into a courtroom is that there are many judges who believe that a person and a human being are synonyms for each other. That all persons are human and all humans are persons. It just so happens that in 2018, all of the non-human animals of the world are things and all the humans of the world are persons. But what the judges oftentimes do not understand and we, and we understand that they're not gonna understand it so we better, we better try to start doing something about it from the get-go uh, they don't understand that what this is is a process that at one time there were many entities on the thing side who were also human beings so black slaves were uh, women uh, children uh, those who were disabled in some way uh, they at one time were all legal things in just uh, just the way non-human animals are or the microphone and that much of the civil rights work of the last centuries has been to move all the human beings slowly, indigenous peoples, women, slaves, children, from the category of thing over to the category of person. They kind of pop into visibility and they stop being things who lack the capacity for rights and they start being persons who have the capacity for rights even though we don't, it, and then we have to begin to fight over what rights indeed they have. So we try to, if we can, if, if we get any time and they read our briefs, we try to explain to the judges that in this, it is indeed a process. And, but it's not only true that on one hand uh, many humans were things, but as we also try to tell the, tell, tell the courts, is that uh, persons has never been limited to humans, is not limited now to humans, and never will be limited to humans. So do us a favor and not think that humans and, and, uh, and persons are synonyms. So, for example, uh, we point out, well, I haven't pointed this one out, though, though I will the next time I'm in court, uh, two weeks ago the Colombian Supreme Court declared the Amazon rainforest a person. Last year, uh, in New Zealand, uh, a river, or two years ago, the Wanganui Iwi River was declared a person. A national park in New Zealand has been, de been declared a person. In India, where I'm heading to, in India, uh, a mosque has been, a Hindu idol has been declared a person. In 2000, the Indian Supreme Court declared the holy books of the Sikh religion a person. In Argentina, in 2016, uh, a court in, in Mendoza declared uh, that Cecilia, a chimpanzee, was a non-human person and pursuant to a writ of habeas corpus, uh, ordered her released and then sent to a sanctuary in Brazil. A speckled bear named Chucho has been the subject of litigation in Colombia. And uh, the first judge said he wasn't a person. Second judge said he was a person. The next judge said he wasn't a person. And we'll have to see what the fourth judge for the, the fourth court says. The only good thing is that I think that court's the one that just declared that the Amazon rainforest is a person. Uh, so uh, I thought that might have shifted the odds you know, somewhat. Uh, but but the, the important thing is to under, is to go in and try to dissuade the judges from their misunderstandings. And that, but that's what they believe for whatever, for whatever reason. We, didn't, we weren't really expecting that, 
because it's not true, and it never has been true, it never will be true, but you know, we see it all, all the time. And so now we know, and when we, when we uh, speak orally in front of the judges, when we write our memoranda, that the first thing we have to do is to begin at the process of trying to make the judges understand that person and things are not, and persons and humans are not synonyms you know, for each other. So, is there a question? I, I thought I'd been entirely crystal, crystal clear. And you, you, Well, they don't. Ha they they do accept corporations or persons. And uh, you know, when Citizens United was, was uh, came down a few years ago, that was, for most of the Americans, that was the first time they ever really realized that a corporation was a person. The way that they are dealing with that issue is they're is they're saying, well, corporations are really made up of humans. Uh, it's from a legal point of view, it's wrong. A corporation is an entity all by itself. Uh, it it shows that that is the quality of, frankly, the bias that resides in the judges that we go in front of. And why shouldn't it? And uh, there's really two kinds of biases. One of them would be an, an implicit bias, and the other would be an explicit bias. So an implicit bias is someone, you know, it, it, it's a bias that, you know, we all have. Any time that we were, were grown up, we grow up in a culture, that, that where that culture has certain kinds of beliefs from the time that we're a child we just we just absorb it and it just automatically believe that that that's how the world is so when when we go in front of a judge we expect that judge with very few exceptions to be implicitly biased against the idea that a non-human animal could be a person and that's something that we have to we have to deal with uh, one of the ways of doing it is, you know, we, we, uh, I've been to, been to Cambridge uh, to talk to the folks at the Implicit Project at, at Harvard to discuss how we can measure that kind of bias, how we, what we might be able to do with that. And then there's the, ex the judges who are expressly biased or explicitly biased against us. You know, it's, it's not unconscious, it's conscious and it's overt. And it can be, it can be really, it's very difficult to get around. Uh, and I mean, even implicit biases, in some ways, are even harder to get around because the judges don't know that they're implicitly biased. And so it's it's uh, uh, it's just there, and we know it's there, and we have to know how to deal with it. Oh, I, I want to show you um, just a quick demo on what a person is, because m many judges don't seem to grasp uh, what a person is either, uh, or period, or they don't grasp it, period. I think, I'm, I'm trying to think of who I meant when I said either. Um, probably lawyers, a lot of lawyers don't understand it either. So let me put it this way. So, if you imagine that this glass is, is filled with rights, every single droplet in this glass is a legal right. So if I dump this glass all over the floor. Nobody has any kind of legal rights. In order to, any, for any entity, human, non-human, rainforest, to have a right, you have to be an entity, and, and the judges or the, and the parliaments have to understand that you have to be an entity that has the capacity to have rights, the capacity to hold rights. And so, what you do is you create a rights holder otherwise known as a person. So this is a rights holder. So when, when a court, what the arguments that, that we're making to courts is that you should understand or that, uh, that the, 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 the elephant, for example, who we are representing, you know, ought to be a person. And all of our litigation is around the arguments as to why the elephant should be a person and why, the, why she should have or they should, they should have certain kinds of rights. But it's important to understand that, you ha that there has to be an, a, an understanding, either implicit or explicit, that the non-human animal on whose behalf we are litigating is a rights holder, otherwise known as a person. And so once that occurs, then you can take your bottle of rights, your glass of rights, and then you start dripping them in. So in, in the cases that we filed now, since we use writs of habeas corpus, we, and uh, what a writ of habeas corpus does, mean, what habeas corpus means is you have the body. It's Latin for you have the body. And 
what it did was develop over centuries to to the point where for our purposes what it means is there's some person who's being detained by some other person against the first person's will so that's what's going on in in our case it would be our elephants are being detained by the by the circus owners against the elephants will so we are we are seeking a writ of habeas corpus and what are we trying to protect well the right that we're trying to protect is the is the is the elephant's fundamental right to bodily liberty which is the same kind of fundamental right that we might have to to bodily liberty and i'll i'll tell you how we we do that so when we file a writ of habeas corpus which we argue one of its fundamental reasons that it exists is to protect bodily liberty because uh, the, because elephants are, have the capacity to be able to move about at, at the very least and they should not be in prison. Same thing for a human being. So note though, a writ of habeas corpus can only be uh, sought on behalf of a person. So we have to show that our non-human animals, whether elephants, chimpanzees, orcas, whoever, are persons. So that's, that's the argument and then the single right that we then talk about or, or, or try to persuade the courts about is, I put in one drop, kind of like Passover, I guess. It, and it's, uh, it's uh, the, so the, the single right we're looking is bodily liberty, that the elephant should have a fundamental right to bodily liberty. That's the first right that we want to drip, drip in. Now, what it means is when you're a person, it doesn't mean that you have every right and that, that every other person has. So for example, by creating personhood, we're not saying that an elephant has all of the rights of a human being. You know, they, no one argues that they should vote or drive cars, you know, or marry your sister. Uh, <laughs> what, we're, what we're looking for is, is just the right to bodily liberty. And that's something also that judges are really concerned about. Our, if, they, if they acknowledge that a non-human animal is a person, you know, even they might ask us, well, they're going to vote, ha ha. And we say, no, ha ha, that, you know, they're not going to vote. Uh, we're, all we're doing is trying to say this elephant has the, is a person and has the right to bodily liberty that is then protected by the writ of habeas corpus. And you, judge, now have the duty to release her and place her in an appropriate sanctuary. So that is what a person is. And, and now you know, more than most judges know, even after I'm finished, my oral argument, uh, that what exactly what a person is and what it is we're trying to do. You know, the, the, the myth that somehow personhood and humans are, are synonyms, you know, is dying, you know, very, very slowly. So what happens then, what the, the Non-Human Rights Project does is that when we're looking at a state that we want to litigate in, uh, well, first of all, we want to see why we want to litigate in it. Uh, when, when we began uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago trying to figure out what states to litigate in, we came up with a list of about 60 questions that we were interested in answering and we went through every, all 50 states and 20 co other English-speaking countries and we looked to see how we thought the courts might rule on all of these 60 issues. Then we took like all 80 or 90 of the jurisdictions and put them in a hierarchy and out came the state of New York and the state of Connecticut, probably California is coming, is coming soon. Other, other states, so we began to, to litigate in those areas. Now, once we did that, it's kind of the opposite of what lawyers usually do. Usually, I might be sitting in my office, somebody comes in with a problem, I know where we're going to litigate it, and we're going to litigate in the state in which I'm sitting in my office. But the Non-Human Rights Project had the luxury of being able to try to, of, of looking at jurisdictions all over the world, all throughout the United States. So we we uh, looked at, at such issues as um, um, do the judges of a state believe in the idea of liberty? And it turned out almost all of them do. Uh, of equality, it turns out almost all of them do. do they, how much do they, uh, do they value habeas corpus? And most states you know, really value habeas corpus. Uh, how do they view standing with respect to habeas corpus? What kind of obstacles might there be to litigating on behalf of habeas corpus? And once we've done that sort of thing, then we then look, begin to look for a client. What client do we want to, to, uh, to 
sue on behalf of. And so we have, and we, we usually choose, and I'll tell you why, um, those who, uh, non-human animals, who are cognitively complex, exceedingly cognitively complex, which, which includes elephants. The reason we do that is that we note that a state like, for example, New York, but probably Oregon too, what they do is that uh, they value the idea of autonomy. When they see a, 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 an autonomous human being, they are extraordinarily interested in protecting the autonomy of that human being, extraordinarily. So, for example, in New York in the 1980s, you began having a case, uh, a series of cases come down in which some, uh, someone would be in a hospital and they were going to die unless they either had some kind of medication or some kind of surgery, and they said, I'd rather die than have the surgery or take the medication. The hospital would go to the courts and the courts and ask the courts to override the autonomy of the patient and give the hospital permission to force them to have the surgery or force them to have the medication. And the courts would say no. Essentially, they'd say, we value, or the state values, their autonomy more than they value their life. So we take note of that, and we say, okay, now we're looking for non-human animals who we can demonstrate to the court are autonomous since the courts say they value autonomy so much. And so that's where, uh, that's the uh, reason, one of the major reasons why we end up litigating on behalf of these extraordinarily cognitively complex non-human animals such as elephants or chimpanzees or, or, or orcas. That's one of the reasons. Another reason is that there's not very many of them in the United States. So we don't, we're not going to start out with the trillion dollar industry uh, who, who is opposing us. Uh, also, uh, it's not something that people are involved in so much. Because we know, for example, the judges that we're going in front of almost certainly are like, you know, wearing leather, you know, they're having a ham sandwich for dinner, they take their kids to the zoo. It's just not, it, it's all part of the implicit bias. They have no idea that we think there's anything wrong with that or that it somehow, you know, relates to our case. Uh, but it's, so we, we look at what the judges say they value and then we frame our arguments in terms of what they have already said they value. So if they say that they value autonomy, we make the arguments that you're not really valuing you know, human autonomy in that autonomy is not important because humans have it. Humans are important because they're autonomous. And so if judges want to do everything they can to protect the autonomy of human beings, there's no reason why they shouldn't want to protect the autonomy of any entity who we can prove that autonomy exists. And, you know, to my surprise, over, over the years, uh, I end up going on radio stations uh, talking about, well, uh, should, um, should artificial intelligence have rights? Should robots have rights? Um, should space aliens have rights? Should re reconstituted Neanderthals have rights? Um, and my answer really is the same. Uh, if, uh, you know, or should algorithms have rights? Uh, I, I talk about that too. And so my argument is that, uh, and is that if they are autonomous, well, yes, they should have rights that would protect their aut autonomy. Now, it's important to understand that when we argue that an autonomous being should have rights, we never argue that it's necessary to be autonomous to have rights. Clearly, there are hundreds of millions or billions of human beings who have legal rights who are not autonomous. We argue that, though, that, an, that an autonomous being of any kind, if we can show that they are autonomous and we can prove that, they ought to have at least certain fundamental rights that protect that autonomy, which means that the, the court has to understand that they are indeed legal persons. So. Uh, we're not starting with robots. Uh, we are starting with, with elephants. We're starting with orcas. We're starting with um, chimpanzees. But that's the reason that we do it, is that we, we argue that autonomy is a sufficient but not a necessary condition for legal rights. So uh, after, I think we're in our fifth year now of litigating uh, the, uh, the um, habeas corpus rights of chimpanzees in the state of New York, uh, if you want some interesting reading sometime, go onto our website and read some of the judicial decisions. They are weird. 
Uh, some of them are just weird. Some of them are like normal. Some of them you watch the judges just go off in some place because they think that, uh, that, that, that humans and, and persons are synonyms. Um, uh, and but right now we, we have a uh, request for the, to the High Court of New York, the New York Court of Appeals, uh, to hear uh, uh, our, la our latest appeals. Uh, but we're also in the state of Connecticut, and we filed suit on behalf of Mula, Beulah, Minnie, and Karen, three uh, elephants, African and Asian, who, are being, uh, who have been trucked around uh, all over New England uh, through the Comerford Zoo now since, since the 1980s. And, we're, and we, we sought a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of them. Uh, we, we did that in November of 2017. On December 26, the judge um, made, their, made an interesting ruling. Uh, so the judge uh, threw our case out. And the reason being, Connecticut um, has a requirement in order to, to even issue a writ of habeas corpus that the, you have to have standing and your case can't be frivolous. So the judge finds that we both don't have standing and our case is frivolous. And so you then look at it. Why is our case frivolous? Because no one's ever done it before. And so we then file a motion for rehearing trying to explain to the judge that every single common law rule that exists in the state of Connecticut once had never existed and somebody had to be the first person to do it. Uh, the judge said that was not persuasive. Uh, we think that it is persuasive and that uh, in fact, we have found cases in Connecticut that say specifically that a case of first impression can never be frivolous because at least the appellate courts understand that that uh, that's, is what's going on. And the disciplinary rules for Connecticut say that if lawyers aren't allowed to file frivolous cases, specifically have, say that if you're seeking to, to change the common law, then it, it can't be a frivolous case. So. Uh, these, uh, the other thing is that, is that the judge said we, we don't have standing and the judge based that on a United States Supreme Court case that the courts of Connecticut have never adopted. You know, Connecticut is a different place than the United States. It has a different court system. Uh, it, uh, the United States, um, it's, you know, you might laugh at this, but this is what judge, this, you're not allowed to laugh in court when the judge says something like that. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, it's really strange when, when, when judges do that. Some of these things we're ready for, some of the things we're not. You know, under, in the United States courts, Article 3 of the United States Constitution sets out the standing requirements. Connecticut doesn't have an Article 3 in the Connecticut Constitution. It doesn't have those standing requirements. So for a judge in Connecticut to throw us out because of what, because a United, we would, might have been thrown out of the United States Supreme Court doesn't make any sense. And it is, by the way, one reason why we never, ever litigate in a federal court. Uh, because uh, it, we, we think that, at least in, two, in the early part of the 21st century, it is impossible to win a case involving uh, the rights of non-human animals in federal court. Not in a state court. Plus, the good news is that there's 50 different you know, ways states we can try, and the bad news is that there's like 50 different states, you know, that we, that we, we you know, we have to try. And so, um, so we try to explain that to the court, that not only did they err in citing to the United States Supreme Court, they didn't cite to any Connecticut cases, and that we try to point out to them, as we did in the state of New York, where, by the way, we got standing every single time that we filed all six of our lawsuits, we got standing. We should have standing in the state of Connecticut as well. And for the same reason, you know, there's no Article Three in the New York Constitution either. And, and more importantly is that we actually point to cases that occurred during, uh, during the time of human slavery. And what would happen again and again is that you would have a, and it happened in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and other states where somebody would claim that a slave is not a slave and ought to be free and is being held against her will and they'd, and they'd seek a writ of habeas corpus. And the person who did that was obviously not the slave because, as we try to explain to judges, in the whole history of the world, when someone holds... So another person prison, a prisoner, they do not let them out to go to court to challenge the fact that they're somebody's prisoner. So it has to be 
by necessity some third party who says, oh my God, someone's being held prisoner. Judge, you've got to issue a writ of habeas corpus. And that indeed is what happened in the Somerset case. It's what happened in other famous cases, the hot and tot Venus case, you know, in England in the early 19th century where you had a uh, black woman who was being displayed, you know, naked essentially in London and the abolitionist society came in and sought a writ of habeas corpus. It happened when, uh, you know, all over the United States, at least in the north, never in the south, but at least in the north, uh, it would happen where someone believes that there, someone else is being enslaved there, that black slaves are being should not be enslaved and they would seek writs of habeas corpus. Abolitionist societies did it all of the time, including in the state of Connecticut. And we point out there's a very famous case in the state of Connecticut where an abolitionist understood that someone, a woman, was being enslaved and he thought she shouldn't be a slave. So he, who doesn't even know who she is, filed a lawsuit on, on her behalf. So we're hoping that the appellate courts of the, of the state of Connecticut uh, will understand that better than the trial court did. Uh, meanwhile, we think that we have the right to file the lawsuit again while we're uh, on, on behalf of the same three elephants while we're appealing the other one and we are uh, just in the process of, do, of, of finishing those uh, pleadings and sometime in the next two weeks we should file again in the state of Connecticut on behalf of Beulah, Minnie and Karen. You know, they need writs of habeas corpus, they need to be taken away from the kind of the hellish life that they live in the circus and they need to go to pause in Sacramento where they'll be able to live out their lives you know as as elephants uh, as elephant persons you know instead instead of elephant things thank you <laughs> yes Uh, is the logical conclusion that the Earth is autonomous? Uh, I don't know how logical it is. It's a, it's a, it's a conclusion. Uh, I, 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 no, I, I, an autonomous being is a being who can consciously make choices. So I don't know of any evidence that the Earth... Amazon. Say it again. Autonomy, we argue, is a, is a sufficient but not a necessary condition. Obviously, the Columbia Supreme Court was not assuming that the Amazon rainforest was autonomous. Uh, just like in New Zealand, they weren't assuming the river was, or the national park, or in India, the holy books of the Sikh religion, or a Hindu idol. There are other reasons. We just argue that autonomy is one of many reasons. But if you, you know, any country that's willing to make the Amazon rainforest a person gives you, or judges, the hint that it's, why, why shouldn't the Earth? The Earth could be seen not as an autonomous being, but as a person with, with certain kinds of rights. And what those rights are would depend. You know, you, once they're a person, then, then you start arguing over which of the rights from the infinite number of rights that are in our rights water glass uh, uh, available. Yeah. Yes, Comberford has a zoo, but, it, but the elephants are really in a, like in a traveling zoo or a traveling circus. I've seen those elephants in many countries, always, let's say... Not at Comberford. No, riding at a camera. They go, that's exactly right. Uh, I've seen them, um, it was just ridiculous thing they used to do up from New York, Montreal, and there's a racetrack there, and here's what they would have, elephants racing. I've right. been to Kenya, you know, I've seen elephants in the wild. I've been to Ambazelli, you know, I've spoke to Cynthia, you know, been with Cynthia Moss. I've seen elephants in captivity and, and I know who they are. And I've talked to elephant experts, you know, all over the world. And to see them, you know, enslaved like that so that they have to spend their lives uh, being trucked. That's what their life is. They're trucked back and forth and they have to walk around in tight circles. And with the people holding a bullhook uh, and with, with people on their back, it's, it's just, um, it, it enrages me. So I have to get rid of that rage before I go into court. Uh, but, but I think that kind of rage actually inf in, in, uh, infects you know, all of us in the Non-Human Rights Project. That's really what moves us forward. It, we, the you know, the, the um, trick is to channel it productively, which we don't have any trouble doing. But uh, every now and then we just get really angry. And that was one of the days when I felt really angry at what I was watching. 
You're very welcome. Uh, I'll be out there. We can, we can chat personally if you'd like.